Hi, my name is Mae Cannon. I'm the Executive Director of Churches for Middle East Peace. We're pleased to have you with us, and we're pleased to have Oday Abdel Jawad Thank here with so us much. from Gaza. <laughs> Um, so today we'll be talking a bit about Oday's story and about what life in Gaza is like. So welcome. Thank you so much. Glad to have you Thanks with us. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Oday is currently serving as an intern here with us at Churches from Middle East Peace in development and advocacy. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about his background before we ask him some questions. So he's currently a master's student in, at Coexistence and Conflict Resolution Program at Brandeis University. Yes. Um, he's a Palestinian refugee who spent his whole life um, growing up in the Gaza Strip. He did an undergraduate degree in English literature at the Islamic University of Gaza. He has experience in the field of education and development since he worked as an English teacher at Ami uh, Amid uh, the Amidist. Amidist, yes, uh, and as a project coordinator at Assist Gaza Foundation, which is a local nonprofit in Gaza. But uh, being devoted to education wasn't enough for him, and O'Day has always challenged himself beyond means and um, to see what he's capable of achieving. So you're also a Fulbright Scholar, is yes. that right? Yeah, that's true. Wonderful. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. So tell us, what's it like growing up in Gaza? How would you, for someone, I just went for the first time in January, but most of the people watching won't have been there before. What, tell, tell us what Gaza's yeah, like. Yeah, I know. It's actually um, a very challenging setting to live in the Gaza Strip, especially in the um, last 10 years, like with the electricity problem, with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, um, as well as other Palestinian-Palestinian conflicts. So this number of conflicts made it actually very hard for me, as well as for other Palestinians growing up. And you know, like, um, it's not easy for us students who actually aspire to travel outside and pursue their education outside of Palestine to travel. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's some of the challenges that face Palestinians living in Gaza every day. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us, we've done a lot of work on the current electricity crisis. We just did a campaign this spring called Lights for Gaza, where we sent in solar-powered lights, 570 solar-powered power lights. And for every light we sent in, we're doing an advocacy meeting on Capitol Hill to educate about the humanitarian crisis there. Tell us about electricity. What's happening there now? What's that like? Well, actually, a year ago when I was living in Gaza, the situation was way better than the situation right now because this, the electricity schedule in Gaza was like six hours on, eight hours off. Sometimes it's four hours on, eight hours off. But now I talked to my family three days ago and they told me that the electricity was off for more than 30 hours continuously wow. yes and so that's very challenging and you know like we need electricity for most of our day's activities mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. not having electricity is very challenging especially for students when I was a student the electricity crisis made my student life very difficult and very challenging like with all the research that we needed to do as students with all the assignments that we had to submit electricity was a problem and even for school students who need to study and do homework not having light is actually a problem a big problem mm -hmm. from your perspective what's the cause of the electricity crisis well so there is the palestinian israeli conflict in the first place but there's mm -hmm. also the palestinian palestinian conflict mm -hmm. like the hamas government in gaza and their conflict with the PA in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. So this made it actually worse. And electricity is being used now um, as a means of pressure on the government, the current government in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Yes, and in the midst of all those challenges, what made you to decide that you wanted to pursue further education? What motivated you or compelled well, actually, you? Actually, I always wanted to to get a master's degree because my father got his master's degree from Iraq and I kind of noticed how our life changed hmm. after he got his master's. Like he got a better job, we were able to afford um, having a better life mm -hmm. from the economic perspective. Yes. 
So, yeah, I actually grew up dreaming of having a master's degree. And I always wanted to get in an English speaking country because I always wanted to be an English teacher. <laughs> and I always wanted to do my master's degree in linguistics or in T cell. But during the last war on Gaza and um, during the very limited um, electricity schedule, I was um, surfing my Facebook page because it was the way people make sure that the people they know are fine. And um, there was a moment when I saw um, two photos, a photo of a Palestinian woman crying in her son's funeral hmm. and another photo of an Israeli woman mm -hmm. crying in her son's funeral. Mm -hmm. So it was actually an enlightening moment. It scared me at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it was the first time for me to see Israelis as non-soldiers mm -hmm. and to see Israelis in another way like they're not an enemy they're just human beings who feel who suffer who lose people they love and I know what it means to lose someone you love because I lost I lost an uncle and I lost two cousins mm -hmm. because of the Palestinian Israeli conflict and then I did a little bit of reading about conflicts mm -hmm. and um, I realized that at least the young Palestinian Israeli generation are part of this conflict system, which makes it hard for us to decide on where we want to stand. Mm -hmm. So I decided on, instead of doing linguistics, doing conflict resolution or peace building degree, and I applied for the Fulbright, and I, I almost got it, and then I had to choose school to go to, and I chose Brandeis. But it was funny because I got an email back saying considering where you're coming from we think it's important for you to know that Brandeis is is, is not officially a Jewish university mm -hmm. but it has a big Jewish population mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so actually that was the main reason why I chose Brandeis wow. because Palestinians in Gaza unlike people in the West Bank they don't get to meet with Israelis so all I know about Israelis and unfortunately there's a misconception that people think that Jews and Israelis are the same. Mm -hmm. So Israelis are our enemies, so Jews are our enemies. Mm -hmm. That's what I grew up thinking and believing. Mm -hmm. So I decided on coming to Brandeis and meeting with the other and just getting to know them. So yeah, that's how I made it to Brandeis. And, and what have you learned since you've been there? Do you feel like oh your God, perceptions? I learned, I learned a lot. <laughs> yes. I, I, Tell us I about I got that. to know the Jewish community at mm -hmm. Brandeis. Mm -hmm. I was actually the first Muslim and the first Palestinian to go to the synagogue mm -hmm. in um, Waltham, which is part of Boston. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I got involved in a lot of Jewish events mm -hmm. and religious holidays like Passover, the Jewish New Year, mm -hmm. um, what else? Yom Kabur. Mm -hmm. So I really got to know the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. and. Um, my main mission was not only to pursue my master's degree, but also to learn about the Jewish community and to teach the Jewish community that there's a lot of Palestinians who still believe in peace between Palestinians and Israelis. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from them and they also learned a lot from me at the same time. So I liked my Brandeis experience. So you felt welcomed and you felt like you've had community there, even in Definitely. the midst of Definitely, actually, I was amazed how similar the Muslim community and the Jewish community are. <laughs> I was amazed by the similarities between Islam and Judaism. Mm -hmm. So, and it kind of upset me because the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is kind of becoming a Muslim-Jewish conflict, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess I needed to do more of like Islam-Jewish thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, talk to us a bit about your hopes for Gaza. What would you like to see happen? What would you like to see for Gaza's future? Okay, well, I guess if I was asked this question 10 years ago, my answer would be totally different than now, mm -hmm. because now all we need is like these very basic, basic rights. Mm -hmm. Like we just need electricity, we just mm -hmm. need good access to water, we just mm -hmm. need right of free movement mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from and to Gaza. Yes. So currently speaking, these are my hopes. And Basic it's necessities. Exactly. And mm -hmm. it's so sad because mm -hmm. usually people are like hoping for bigger things. Mm -hmm. But now in, 
in 2017, we're just hoping to have electricity and access to, wa to clean water. Clean water. What would your answer have been 10 years ago? Well, I would have, I would have talked about like um, maybe, well, okay, 10 years ago, my perspective towards the Palestinian-Israeli conflict it was not the same as my perspective now. Yeah. So maybe I would have answered with like an end to the, well, not an end to the Israeli co uh, occupation, but an end to the Israeli existence in Palestine. Hmm. But that's not what I'm calling for now. Yes. I'm just calling for an end to the occupation. Yes. And yes. what would you call for now? I mean, do you think that that viewpoint that you had previously is problematic from your perspective now? I'm not sure I understood your question. So you said that formally you might have called for there to not be the existence of the state of Israel. Ten years. Ten years ago. ago. But that's not how you feel now. No, no. Right. And so do you yes. think that the way that you used to think about that is problematic? It is problematic. Yeah. Say something like about lost, that. It, we've been losing so many people mm -hmm. because we, we believed in and into the Israeli existence in Palestine. Mm -hmm which is so hard to achieve and which is not fair to achieve now. Mm -hmm. Because now we have a lot of generations of Israelis who were born in Palestine, mm -hmm. historic Palestine. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. so they yes. were born there. So now we both believe that we have the right to live in this piece of land. Mm -hmm. So I guess having the two peoples living on this piece of land is the best solution. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to lose more people because if we keep on losing people who's gonna live there <laughs> so right. yeah there's like I actually find it funny a funny statement that nationalist movement keep on repeating that we die so that Palestine lives mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. funny because if, if people die <laughs> who's gonna live who's there gonna, right yeah right so currently speaking I guess that the best solution for this travel political situation in Palestine is having a two-state solution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where Israelis could live with self-determination and peace and Palestinians could so as well. So with Palestinians, mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and for those watching um, who might not know a lot about Gaza or who maybe are engaged in different ways, what would be your encouragement to them about what role they can play in supporting or encouraging a hope and a future for Gaza? Yeah, well, first, please read, read, and read about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict because during my life in Gaza, I met with so many peace activists and I'm sorry to say this, but they don't know anything about the Palestinian-Israeli mm -hmm. conflict. Mm -hmm. All they want is just coming to Palestine or coming to Gaza because it's, just, it's such a hot, big name to have on your resume. They just want to have experience in Gaza and then leave, which mm -hmm. is actually destructive. Mm -hmm. they're, not, mm -hmm. they're not helping. Mm -hmm. and. We don't really need more peace activists who are like very biased to either side. Mm -hmm. We just need people to bridge the, this gap because we there's already a gap between the Palestinian and the Israeli communities. Mm -hmm. So we just need people to connect us instead of dividing us. Hmm. It sounds like your perspective shifted significantly over the years, that you've grown so much and that it used to be that you just had a hope for your own people's future and now you have a hope for the people of Israel as well. Yeah, exactly. Actually, this is what happens when you get to to meet the other and when mm -hmm. you get to talk to, to the other. Because if you talk to like the older generation, like the men who used to, I'm saying men because it was only men who used to work in Israel. Mm -hmm. So if you talk to them, they're like very pro-peace because mm -hmm. they got to work with Israelis, Israelis, they got to know them, and it, like they're so hopeful hmm. Hmm. in regard to this situation. Yes. Like they're not really minding a one-state solution. They're not minding living with Israelis because they got to know them. But I kind of find it find it a little bit challenging now, like to call for a one-state solution, mm -hmm. because people still need to know each other mm -hmm. more. And there's so much isolation right now exactly. in terms of like you so talked about in Gaza. I don't think it's going to be healthy to have the two peoples all of a sudden right. living in one place. Yes, is there anything else you'd like for people watching to know? Well, that's it. Thank <laughs> you so much. And um, I really wish that 10 years from now, 
we'll be having like a more promising and hopeful conversation. That would be wonderful. Yeah. That's a good <laughs> aspiration. May it be so. Thank so. you so much, May. And I really appreciate the work that you do at Churches mm -hmm. for Middle East Peace. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm very glad that I am grateful that I got to know you and to know the work that you do for the Palestinian Israeli. Thank conflict. you. Thank you. Thank you so We're much, glad to May. have you working with us. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks, OJ.